Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our webinar today on safety event investigation in a safety management system. My name is Andy Lofton, and I'm a contractor supporting FTA's Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, or PTASP Technical Assistance Center. Joining me for today's webinar is Paulina Orchard, the Acting Director of FTA's Office of System Safety. We're also very excited today to be joined by three transit industry professionals to share their experience and perspective on conducting safety event investigation within an SMS. And that's Mr. Frank Konorek, a compliance analyst with the Luzerne County Transportation Authority. Mr. Nick Oldham, Senior Safety Program Manager with WeGo Public Transit. And Mr. BJ Takushi, Principal Safety Specialist with LA Metro. Now, throughout the webinar today, we want to engage with you. And we invite you to, if you have questions at any time, to ask them. The way that you ask those questions is to use the Q&A pod in your Microsoft Teams application. And the way that you can access that, is you actually click on the little talk bubble with a question mark in it at the top of your Microsoft Teams window. And you can use that to ask questions on any of the content that we're talking about today or any questions you have on the topic. Now, throughout our presentation, as those questions are coming in, <clears throat> we have a team of facilitators that are going to be queuing all of those up. And we're going to set them aside for a Q&A portion that we hold at the end of our webinar. Now, for those of you who are familiar with all of our webinars that the PTAS TAC has put on to date, you already know what I'm about to say, but I, I want to share it for anybody who's new. The materials that you see today, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be published and made available to you for download via the FTA's PTASP Technical Assistance Center resource library. Now, those materials are typically posted to the website within a couple of days of um, the website, or excuse me, the webinar's conclusion. So, You'll probably see those available by Thursday or Friday of this week. Um, again, and if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please feel free to ask those questions using the Q&A pod as we're moving through content. And with that, we want to get started and cover today's webinar objectives. So our objectives, number one, we want to discuss the requirements for safety event investigation. And we also want to dis, um, discuss considerations and examples for carrying out safety investigations within your agency's safety management system. Right? We always want to focus first on what are the requirements in the regulation, and then we want to talk about what that can look like in practice at your agency. So the agenda for today's session, number one, as I mentioned, we're going to start by discussing those requirements. We're going to think about the considerations, what these look like in practice. And then we're going to turn our presentation over to our transit industry representatives who are going to share their perspective and their experience on conducting safety event investigations within an SMS. And then we'll get to our, our favorite part of our webinar, which is our Q&A session where we get to review all the questions that we've collected and provide answers. And of course, we're also going to engage our industry representatives in helping us answer some of those questions as well. And before we get started and get into our content today, we do want to clarify something. And this is related to any of our rail transit agency participants today. So as you're probably aware, your state safety oversight agency may establish additional requirements for safety event investigation at your transit agency. Please keep in mind that today's presentation will not cover requirements related to the safety oversight regulation, part 674. And instead, our content today and our focus are on the requirements and considerations related to safety event investigation within part 673, the PTAS regulation. 
So with that, let's get started and begin by discussing from a high level our safety management system. So we can help frame our discussion today on safety event investigation and remind ourselves where this lives within our SMS and the four components of an SMS. Now, everybody at this stage is probably very familiar with an SMS and the four components that make up that SMS, right? The PTAS regulation establishes requirements for all four of these components, and that includes safety promotion, that includes safety management policy, and it includes safety risk management and safety assurance. Now, the focus of today's webinar, safety event investigation, lives within that bottom blue safety assurance arrow. It's one of the elements within safety assurance that makes up our overall safety management system. And so now let's take a look at the three elements that comprise safety assurance. Number one, safety performance monitoring and measurement. And this element of safety assurance is the home of safety event investigation based on the language within part 673. Now, safety assurance also includes elements, management of change and continuous improvement. We do want to make a, a note here to remind our participants that both of these elements, management of change and continuous improvement, are not required if your agency is a small public transportation provider. However, safety performance monitoring and measurement in the associated requirements do apply to all transit agencies under the PTAS regulation. So safety performance monitoring and measurement, this first element of safety assurance, includes four activities according to the PTAS regulation, Part 673-27B. And those four activities are number one, monitoring compliance with our agency's operations and maintenance procedures, and also monitoring the sufficiency of those operations and maintenance procedures. Number two, monitoring safety risk mitigations. Number three, monitoring internal safety reporting programs. And finally, again, the focus of today's webinar, conducting investigations of safety events to identify causal factors, 673-27B4. So let's now take a moment to talk about what we mean by safety event. Now the PTAS regulation defines event. It doesn't give us a very detailed definition of the word event itself or safety event. It defines event as one of three things, an accident, an incident, or occurrence. So in that definition, it doesn't really give us a lot to work with. However, the PTAS regulation also includes specific definitions of each of these subcategories of event. It gives us a definition of incident, a definition of incident, and a definition of occurrence. So accident, the PTAS regulation says that this is an event that involves a loss of life, a serious injury, collision of public transportation vehicles, a runaway train, evacuation for life safety reasons, or the derailment of a rail transit vehicle. In this middle category of safety events, incident includes an injury that is not a serious injury, one or more injuries that require medical transport away from the scene. And it also includes damage to facilities, equipment, rolling stock, or infrastructure that disrupt transit operations. And our third category occurrence is an event without any personal injury in which damage to facilities, equipment, rolling stock, or infrastructure does not disrupt operations. So those are our definitions of the overall safety event in each of the three categories that comprise safety event. So that's really the first half of what we're talking about today. Those are the events, the things investigated. Now let's take a look at the second half. And what do we mean by investigation? 
Well, the PTAS regulation defines investigation for us, and it defines it as the process of determining the causal and contributing factors of an accident, incident, or hazard for the purposes of preventing recurrence and mitigating risk. So our definition of investigation, it actually includes some other terms worth taking a peek at, and the first is risk. The PTAS regulation defines risk as the composite of predicted severity and likelihood of the potential effect of a hazard. And it also gives us a definition of risk mitigation, which is a method or methods to eliminate or reduce the effects of a hazard. The PTAS regulation clearly identifies what we're talking about when we say investigation. Now, although not defined, explicitly in part 673 causal and contributing factors as mentioned in the previous slide they could be defined as, as factors that directly led to the event and contributing factors could be defined as factors that made that event either more likely to occur or perhaps they made the effects of that event more severe so for example you could define causal factors as key actions, situations, or conditions that if they had not been present, would have completely prevented or reduced the effects of a safety event. And contributing factor you can think of as action situations or conditions that either made that event more likely to happen, or they made the final effects, the outcomes of that event more severe. So let's take a look at an example of these two things, causal factors and contributing factors. So let's say we have a worker who trips and falls over a tool that was left on the shop floor. And she, she falls over this tool while carrying a large box. So in our example, the two factors are number one, the tool that was left on the shop floor, and number two, the large box she's carrying. So how do we know which one we want to consider as the causal factor? Well, one way to think about this is that the causal factor is going to be the factor that directly resulted in the trip or fall. Now, in real life, of course, it's important to think about the fact that there may be more than one causal factor in an event. But for our example, it's, let's just for simplicity focus on one. And the easiest way to figure out is this a causal factor or contributing factor is to try to imagine the scenario without the factor entirely. And what would have happened if one of the factors wouldn't have been present? So in our example, if we remove the tool from the scenario and there's no tool left on the ground, well, then the worker would not have tripped. So that tells us that the causal factor in this example is the tool that was left on the shop floor. But what about our other factor? What about the large box that she was carrying? Now, without the box, for example, the worker may still have tripped over the tool that was left on the floor. Carrying the box or not carrying the box still could have fallen and tripped over the tool left on the floor. However, this in and of itself did not directly lead to the trip and fall. Again, so examples of how you could discern and break down what's our causal factor and what is our contributing factor. So while that trip and fall may have still happened, if she wasn't carrying the box, the trip and fall would not have happened if the tool wasn't on the shop floor. So that, that's what we have concluded. That's what this means is that the causal factor is related to the tool left on the shop floor and the contributing factor is the box that the individual was carrying. So now that we're all on the same page with our definitions, what we'd like to do is to take a closer look at accident event or excuse me event investigations in an sms 
And of course, everyone is familiar with safety event investigations, obviously not new to the transit community. Right? We've always been conducting safety event investigations. However, prior to the PTASP regulation and before the um, SMS approach took root in the transit industry, agencies may have been conducting safety event investigations um, a little bit differently. Right, the process, the form, and the outcome of investigations perhaps varied from agency to agency. And for example, prior to the PTAS regulation and prior to SMS across the transit industry, many transit agencies may have focused on preventability. Is this event in a, a preventable or is it a non-preventable? And it focused on fault as the purpose of their accident investigations. However, an important distinction between the previous general approach to accident investigations and what's required under the PTASP regulation is that safety event investigations conducted under an SMS are conducted in order to determine causal and contributing factors for the purpose of preventing the recurrence of that event and for mitigating safety risk. Right, so this approach is going to focus on a wide range of organizational, human, equipment, environmental factors that ultimately allowed this event to occur rather than solely on the individual involved. So FTA published a simple hazard classification system, and this document describes categories that agencies can use to classify hazards and causal factors and to help assist you in developing an approach to implementing safety event investigations within your SMS with that purpose of identifying causal and contributing factors. And this document is available on FTA's PTASP TAC resource library. Now, the actions of an individual are still very important in investigations that are conducted under a, an SMS. However, the reason that a person acted a certain way is much more important to an investigation under safety management system. Right, addressing the causal and addressing the contributing factors ultimately can be much more effective in your agency's efforts to prevent the recurrence of that event, right? So what we're saying is that by addressing the underlying condition that allowed the event to occur, rather than just addressing the actions of the indiv individual, your agency can perhaps more effectively prevent recurrence. All right, it's important to remember that causal factors can include other factors besides just the individual. And now what we would like to do is to take a look at an example, a sample event hypothetical that can help us understand the actions of an individual and causal factors associated with it. And our example today is a situation where a bus collides with a car in an intersection. Right, and the initial investigation determines that this occurred, why? Because the bus driver ran a red light. Now at that point, this may be enough for the agency to be able to determine fault and preventability, right? The agency perhaps can suspend the bus driver, can effectively retrain the bus driver, but why would it be important to look for deeper causal factors and contributing factors? Well, the reason why is that if the agency were to stop at that first why, they may miss the deeper whys. And they may miss underlying causal and contributing factors. Some hypothetical examples of what those may be. Perhaps the bus driver was experiencing fatigue after working longer than maybe was allowed by the agency's fatigue policy. 
Hypothetically, we could think of things like glare on the windshield, which could obscure the traffic signal and led the operator to disregard that signal, or potentially even distraction due to communications, call over the radio. So ultimately, these deeper whys provide the agency with much more information about the underlying conditions that allowed the event to occur. And with that information, the agency much more effectively prevent that type of event from occurring in the future. So let's look at our example a little bit further. Each of these possible conditions, right? Bus driver fatigue after working longer than allowed, glare on the windshield, distraction related to communications. Each one of these can be considered a causal factor. And this is an important point that we do want to emphasize is that a safety event may have multiple causal and contributing factors. And that it may be important for the agency to continue looking for those deeper whys in order to be able to more effectively prevent recurrence. Now, beyond the determination of causal and contributing factors, safety event investigations provide valuable information for other safety assurance activities going on at your transit agency. Right? And think about the activities that are executed part of your investigations, interviews, records reviews, measurements that are taken as part of the investigation and other activities. This can all provide really valuable information for safety assurance activities such as monitoring compliance of operations and maintenance procedures, ensuring that those operations and maintenance procedures are sufficient to achieve their purpose, valuable information for monitoring the effectiveness of the risk safety risk mitigations the agency's put in place, for monitoring internal safety reporting programs at the agency, and also for supporting the agency's continuous improvement. Now, similarly, investigations may uncover areas of safety concern that the agency may assess more formally under the safety risk management component of the SMS. Right? Investigations can provide, these are, think about what your outputs from your investigation that can feed other components of your SMS. Right? These investigations can give you really valuable data and information to support elements of SRM, especially safety risk assessment. So for example, what you gather through your accident investigations may help your agency better determine things like likelihood ratings as part of your safety risk assessment or severity ratings as part of your safety risk assessment and can even support the review of previous likelihood and severity determinations that your agency um, that your agency documented in its safety risk register. Also, safety investigations may uncover hazards that need to be communicated out to workers who could, as part of their activity, come into contact with that hazard or that condition. Right. And so thinking about how our safety event investigations can feed other components like safety promotion. Additionally, when we're thinking about safety promotion is that investigations and the information that we collect. May point to and identify gaps in training. And might also point and highlight the need for addition, the development of additional safety training. And so our investigations don't just stop within safety assurance. They feed all of our other components. Now, on the other hand, we can also think about how safety event investigations have inputs, right, and can benefit from information from the other SMS processes in place at our agency. So for example, your agency could leverage safety assurance elements 
to help you narrow down causal and contributing factors. And some examples of what we mean, leveraging data on compliance with maintenance procedures, leveraging reports from your agency's internal safety reporting programs, leveraging trend analysis, safety performance analysis that your agency has, as well as leveraging information on safety risk mitigations that may or may not be performing as expected. And for safety promotion, this component can offer valuable input in the form of training records, which can be leveraged by investigators to help them narrow down both causal factors and contributing factors as part of the investigation. Now, next, we want to move on and talk about considerations. And so in practice, considerations for implementing safety event investigations as part of your SMS based on the requirements of Part 673 and start talking about what it means to begin to implement safety event investigations as defined by the PTAS regulation. And whenever we're talking about implementation, one way to consider this approach is to number one, identify and then address our implementation gaps. Right? And we're presenting here is a simple three-step approach to this. And it starts with number one, evaluate our implementation status. Right? How well are we carrying out our, our processes as defined in our ASP? Number two, characterize any gaps in implementation. Better understand them, understand the source of this gap in implementation so that we can more effectively do step three, which is where we address the implementation gap. In other words, we're going to close the gap. Now let's talk in a little bit more detail about the first step, evaluating safety of investigation implementation status. Whenever we talk about evaluation of implementation status, we're really talking about comparing what we have written down, our process in our agency safety plan, and we're going to compare that to our observations of what's happening in practice at our agency. Now, if what we observe matches what we have documented that we're going to do, well, then we don't, that's a great thing. Then we don't have any implementation gaps. However, if we look at what's documented in our ASP and our observations indicate that our agency in practice is doing something different than that or not doing that entirely, well, then we've just identified an implementation gap. And then that leads us to step two of this three step implementation process. And step two, we characterize implementation gaps. Now, when we look at implementation gaps, we might find that there's a variety of reasons for, for why a gap exists versus another gap. And so, what we've presented here are three basically gap sources or reasons why an agency may have an implementation gap, right? The first type of gap would be what we call doing something new. And this may be where our agency safety plan defines a new activity, something that we haven't engaged in previously at our agency. The second type of gap would be doing something differently. And this is where our new SP has, has defined an and a safety event investigation process, which means we now have to do things a little bit differently than we did in the past. And in fact, these types of changes may be more challenging than doing something entirely new because as we know, when we when we do something one way for a long time, it's a lot harder for us to do it differently. And the third type of category is, is doing something consistently. And this may be where an agency has something in place, but perhaps it's not applied agency-wide. Or perhaps it's dormant or sporadically applied in our agency and it needs to be restored and implemented consistently. And that takes us to our third step, which is where we just we need to close that gap. And then this third step, what's recommended is for an agency to now that we've identified the gap. 
now that we understand it, we're going to develop a project to close that gap. And when we talk about a project, we're talking about identifying what is the outcome that we hope to achieve by taking these steps. What are the specific tasks that we are going to undertake to close the gap? What are the roles and responsibilities? Who's going to do what? Who's responsible for, for things? And the timelines, milestones, and due dates to ensure that we close the gap according to the timelines defined by our agency and according to our agency need. And what we'd like to do next is discuss some common implementation gaps. And these gaps are gaps that the that FTA has identified through its work through the PTAS Technical Assistance Center directly with transit agencies. Now, as I discussed earlier, many agencies have conducted accident investigations for a long time, but have been very effective at determining fault and determining whether or not the event was preventable or not preventable. And what that means is that some agencies may not have been identifying causal factors as part of those investigations. And this could represent an implementation gap at an agency that now has an ASP that defines a safety event investigation process with the purpose of identifying causal and contributing factors. So this means that there may be a gap. And it's very likely that if that gap exists, that this is a gap that we categorize as doing something differently. We've conducted these investigations for years, but now our ASP is asking us to do, to do this activity, but just do it differently than we had in the past. Now we need to determine causal factors as required by the PTAS regulation and our ASP. So for that example, we know what our gap is. The agency does not currently identify causal factors as part of its investigations. Characterization, we need to do something differently. We're gonna to have to modify our existing activity. And so a project, an example project of what could be done, right? It could modify existing investigation materials that are built around the new approach defined in the ASP. It can modify its training documentation. It could modify, excuse me, its, its investigation documentation and also its investigation training materials and actually provide retraining for those individuals doing this modified task. And now let's take a look at another example, which is interfacing safety event investigations with other agency functions. Now, in our example, we have an agency that currently does not have a process for documenting the information that it gathers through the safety event investigations it's conducting. And so to address this implementation gap, the agency develops a process that it's going to use to document relevant information from those investigations by doing this project. Number one, it's going to identify the types of information that are typically gathered through the investigations. It's going to define the authorities, accountabilities, and responsibilities associated with the documentation of this investigation information. And it's going to train safety event investigation, excuse me, safety event investigators on the types of information that they need to document and how they are going to document that. And with that, it brings us to our uh, most exciting part of our webinar today, which is where we get to hear from our transit industry representatives. And our first guest is Mr. Frank Konorak. And Frank comes from the Luzerne County Transportation Authority or LCTA in Kingston, Pennsylvania. Frank is a program coordinator within LCTA's Office of Regulatory Compliance and Administrative Services. He's responsible for managing the agency's internal and external public policy development, program management, state and federal regulatory compliance monitoring, legislative research, and government affairs. Frank has served 10 years in public administration and seven years in public transit. He's a graduate of Wilkes University with a BA in political science, pre-law studies, and a minor in business administration. And Frank, welcome 
and I'm now going to turn the microphone over to you for your portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the FTA for the invitation to speak today, and uh, it's an honor, and I'm glad to be here to share our agency knowledge and experience uh, with those listening. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our staff and our operators here at LCTA, who are some of the best in the business, and uh, especially over the last year with COVID going on, uh, getting people to go where they need to be. Um, so our agency is nearly um, 50 years old, and it was first established as a demonstration system after the 1972 Agnes flood that destroyed the Wyoming Valley within uh, Luzerne County, where we're located. Um, here's some information about both our fixed route system and our paratransit system, um, the ridership numbers, and our route and fleet composition. We're making our move to um, uh, hybrid CNG powered vehicles. Um, our bus fleet is around 40, and uh, we service pre-COVID around 1.1 million uh, unlinked passenger ships on our fixed route system. And our paratransit system is also operated in-house, uh, 49 vehicles, and we do 116,000 uh, unlinked passenger ships annually. Um, again, pre-COVID numbers. Um, our system is very diverse, and we directly service three third-class cities that have populations ranging from 10 to 50,000. Um, system also services are like m like most um, major shopping districts, three hospitals, an arena, a casino hotel, three colleges, an airport, even a state park, and two large industrial parks. Um, however, most of our system is suburban and even rural, consisting of fragmented townships and boroughs that are endemic to Pennsylvania. Um, can I have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so for today's discussion, um, my presentation is going to center around two topics related to SMS, and those being the process LCTA has established in our agency safety plan for safety event investigations, and how LCTA identifies um, safety event causal factors. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. So as it was alluded earlier, um, LCTA, our operations and our safety and training managers, were already conducting most of the activities outlined in our agency safety plan prior to being uh, implemented. Um, the formal introduction of SMS and the safety plan allowed our agency to create a standardized process using standardized documents, um, most importantly that is repeatable across the agency, both our paratransit, our maintenance, and our fixed route divisions. Uh, many activities were prior were insurance and safety committee driven when it came to accident and event investigations. So now that we have a process and documentation to record, analyze, and analyze safety event actions, um, our most important um, key to all this is our data. So data comes from performance monitoring, monitoring of the system and the employee's safety reporting program. Um, the data tells us if we if the activities and events taking place have a risk to them, risk can then be mitigated or monitored for safety outcomes, i.e. by running an event through our safety risk matrix. Um, the risk matrix tells us if we need to do anything at all, change the procedure, introduce training, how often it's going to occur, and it has severity and the impacts on the agency. Um, can I have our next slide, please? So this slide shows our various data sources our agency has identified within the agency safety plan when it comes to safety performance monitoring and measurement activities. Um, we conduct each one of these um, bullet points um, as part of our ASP um, within the SMS guidelines to, to, again, generate that data and from that data look at our system risk uh, so one key takeaway I'd like to also highlight here is the use of other FTA programs and their impact on providing data. Um, those being the Transit Asset Management Plan and the FTA DOT Drug and Alcohol Program. Um, those two programs shed light on data and activities that could lead to a risk. Um, so as far as Transit Asset Management, was the vehicle maintained properly? Was it inspected? 
Were there issues with the vehicle? Was the operator fit for duty? Um, can the operator's actions be discounted in a safety event occurrence? And again, this leads to what external factors led to the, to the event. Um, go ahead to our next slide. So to sum it up, um, when a safety event occurs, was it because of a current risk mitigation failure or a newly developed causal factor? Um, go on to our next slide. So these last three slides that we're going to discuss are really going to tie everything together. Um, again, looking at data and risk mitigations and all these terms that we're talking about. Um, our agency identifies causal event factors by conducting a series of standardized steps to gather data as part of the accident investigation process. We already know the event outcome. There was an accident or an event that took place or an occurrence. But we must put the pieces back together and determine what caused the event to occur and prevent it from happening again. Um, it has to tell the story, um, and the way to do that is by gathering data to determine risk and, uh, again, tell that story of um, what all happened to put that event in perspective. Um, and these are the steps here um, that we use, um, not necessarily in order, but usually um, it leads to this next step that we have here on this slide. Um, you can see how we take all the information from the previous slide and place it into a single sheet to help us piece um, the safety event back together and tell the story of the accident or incident. Um, this document here is an integral part of the safety event investigation process and the SMS within our safety plan. Um, as you can see, this process is data-driven, but this sheet allows the chief safety officer to take uh, quantitative and qualitative data, um, again, and have a, a source and be able to cite, cite it and helping to create a narrative um, for the accident investigation. This sheet also examines each individual causal factor and helps determine contributing factors that were present, causal events, and if they're related and lead to mitigate, mitigation strategies. Uh, next slide, please. So the closeout process, in closing, we use the data and processes outlined within our ASP to answer Key questions related to any event investigation, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And this process also allows us to answer questions related um, within the SMS processes um, that are mandated by FTA. Um, that would conclude my presentation today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session held later on. So thank you again. Frank, thank you so much for that presentation. We really appreciate it. And a reminder to everyone on the webinar today, if you have any questions for Frank, please feel free to enter them through the Q&A pod and you can address them to Frank when you um, submit them. And with that, we wanna move on to our next presenter. Um, and this is Nicholas Oldham. And Nick is from WeGo Public Transit in Nashville, Tennessee. And Nick is the Senior Safety Program Manager at WeGo. He started his career in transit as a bus operator, and he has certifications in supply chain management and data analytics. Nick has a BS in computer science and an MA in theology. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Nick. Nick, it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. A uh, really warm, uh, welcoming intro. And uh, so, yeah, I will talk a little bit about uh, just our agency, but first, uh, definitely want to thank FTA uh, for the opportunity to present here on the webinar. And uh, as Frank did with, with his colleagues, definitely want to thank all my colleagues at, at WeGo Public Transit. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the WeGo Public Transit really is um, the national MTA and the RTA operating bodies uh, that offer three main types of bus services. So we do local, uh, regional, and access. Of course, we've, we've got about 26 routes on our, on our local bus service. Uh, we do about eight regional bus routes, and then we have one commuter train uh, that comes in uh, servicing about four to five different counties. Uh, we operate from 4 a.m. Uh, to midnight 
about uh, 735 employee total employees. About 400 of those are bus operators, about 120 uh, mechanics, and then uh, the rest uh, admin. And uh, then finally, we have our access, our paratransit ADA door-to-door um, -door service that uh, we just do that service within, uh, within Davidson County. Uh, so as we transition to, to the next slide, uh, really just kind of want to give you a really, really, really basic uh, outline of, of what I'll cover today, um, just an overview. So I plan on talking about the process that our agency established in our agency safety plan for uh, safety event investigation. Uh, then we'll talk about the plan and how we implemented the, the safety management system oriented uh, event investigation process. Uh, then we'll talk about the improvement, how we identify uh, causal factors and, and what led to the identification of causal factors. And then lastly, uh, as we transition to the next slide, just lessons learned, experiences, uh, the, the, the tough knocks on the head relating to implementing a, a SMS-oriented investigation approach. So as we transition to the next slide, uh, you're going to see kind of our process. This, this is, these are the steps that we took, and it, it, it'll probably be difficult for you to see all of the, all of the details on your screen. Uh, but really, you know, this is our, this is our process. We, when an incident, accident, or occurrence happens, uh, typically, our operations supervisors are sent out uh, to the to the accident, and they all have tablets. Um, and as Frank said uh, very eloquently, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were uniform in our approach uh, to doing these kinds of reports. And so they have tablets that have uh, forms and everything that they need uh, to to gather all the information they need to gather. It's already preloaded on those tablets. Um, there's uh, areas for them to take pictures and. Uh, really just get a overall understanding and start the initial investigation process for what happened. Um, and, and so then that uh, step two is they turn that over to uh, the safety department. Uh, of course, we pulled a video. This kind of uh, alludes to what Andy was talking about initially in that, you know, we initially were just doing this to kind of determine who was at fault. Uh, but the SMS requires us to take it obviously steps further. Uh, so we compile that information, pull the video from the buses, send it to our insurance uh, companies, uh, you know, kind of to help us weed through the claims process and, uh, you know, have that all of that was attached with police reports, if there were um, a police report. And then step three, we compile that report and send it over to our maintenance department, who then kind of looks at the cost of, of replacing parts. Um, and that was used for step four to kind of determine um, if the operator was at fault, um, you know, their, the cost of the damages would help us to determine what kind of discipline uh, the, the operator received. Uh, and obviously, according to our uh, collective bargaining agreement with our local union, uh, they had, we had 10 days to, to assess that information. Um, and then if retraining was needed, that, that operator would be uh, suspended or, or retrained um, based on the thresholds that they met. Um, so again, uh, as we move on to the next slide, that was, you know, how we did it in the past before SMS. But obviously SMS says you got to now look at causal factors. So how do we implement this and how, how do we find those causal factors? Um, and this is what I, this was very profound to me when I started looking, <laughs> looking at this when I stepped into this role, but, but this picture is a picture of Scott Snook's theory of practical drift. And basically, the ICAO defines practical drift as when operational performance is different from baseline performance. So that top line you see there is when a, when a standard operating procedure is initially deployed, that top line represents the driver performance that meets that defined standard. The bottom line, the more slanted solid bottom, bottom line represents the degree by which the riskiest driver's performance has deviated from those defined standards. And then the dotted line in the middle uh, represents accident causation, or as James T. Reason uh, defines it as the Swiss cheese model. And basically, the Swiss cheese model 
says that although many layers of defense lie between hazards and accidents, there are flaws in each of those layers that, if aligned, can allow the accident to occur. So even though we have <clears throat> regulations in, in place and we've put the operators through training or uh, there's technology, all of those layers of defense, uh, when they, they can line up and where the, the gaps, where those gaps align, that's where accidents can occur. And so how did we move from just uh, assigning fault to finding causal factors was really casting a, a searchlight in the, into the darkest corners of our organization's management systems and challenging long held assumptions about the way they perform in practice. Because let's be honest, you know, operator may start in year one and they may be following all the standard operating procedures, but they start to cut corners or the maintenance may not tie in uh, as they're on a lift or something. And so as they begin to drift away, uh, that's where a lot of the accidents start to happen. And, and if we're honest, all organizations operate to some degree within practical drift. You know, some may uh, stray from the baseline and then oscillate a little bit uh, away from uh, the baseline performance. And yet others, they, they tend to deviate very slowly, almost insidiously at first. And then they barrel toward the boundary of unsafe operations. And so the key that we found was to capture the drift prior to it reaching the boundary. And of, and of course, ideally, would be to catch the drift at inception um, and, and kind of quickly fling it back to the baseline performance. But what we found was catching that drift prior to reaching a, a defined boundary so that we could stop that accident or prevent, mitigate that accident from happening. And so how was that done? We did that through monitoring operations, as Frank uh, pointed out earlier. Uh, so as we, as we transition to the next slide, this, this practical drift helped us to understand that we needed to do causal analysis. And so as you see it come up on the screen, you'll see a form that we use, uh, very much like Frank, um, to kind of help us identify. It's easy and very easy to just blame the operator and say it's the operator's fault. Uh, but good investigation always kind of seeks to identify all the factors that combine to cause an accident. So, you know, we use this form to say, all right, uh, was, it, was it equipment and infrastructure factors, uh, such as service design? You know, if, if, if a route is going through uh, this tiny street with cars on both sides, are we marveled at the fact that mirrors keep popping off the buses? You know, so we're we're identifying these. It could be uh, infrastructure in terms of our service design or vehicle failures, um, or it could be environmental factors, bad weather, or road construction. If we know that construction is going to be happening on a particular road for months at a time, uh, you know, should we reroute that 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 particular route to uh, to avoid that construction? So all of these factors are now what we use to and look at to say, all right, how can we improve and make sure that if this accident or incident did occur, how do we mitigate it down so that it doesn't occur, reoccur in the future? Um, and so as, as we transition to our last slide, uh, just, just lessons learned. Um, you know, the, I think the biggest lesson that we learned was uh, as our executives were looking at implementing uh, not only just the uh, accident investigation part, uh, but just the SMS as a whole, was we had to hire a consultant. Um, thankfully, we ran across uh, Reem Lazaro of, uh, of uh, BCG, and uh, Reem was just, I mean, uh, he was a rock star in coming in and kind of observing what our best practices uh, were and kind of, as, as Annie pointed out earlier, recognizing where those gaps were uh, in performance. Um, so definitely, definitely recommend hiring a consultant. Uh, number two, uh, the other lesson was we involved our, our, um, our, our SMEs, our subject matter experts in the causal analysis steps. So I don't know everything about uh, you know, service design and demand response. And yeah, I don't know all of that. So we quickly said, hey, we need subject matter experts to come in and help us uh, determine where we can mitigate some of these uh, incidences from happening. And then lastly, um, move slow. 
you know, e even though we were under a deadline and, um, you know, FDA was very gracious in extending uh, the deadline because of the pandemic. Uh, but if we if we had a rush through it, we would have missed some of the very uh, small details that led to some of our biggest aha moments. So I encourage everyone to kind of move slow through each step so you really get a, a understanding of where your organization is uh, as opposed to where it should be as defined by uh, the FTA's SMS. And uh, with that, that concludes my presentation and I'll turn it back over to you. Nick, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing your time with us today to offer your perspective and experience on Implementing safety event investigations in the SMS, we go. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to move to our third presenter today. And that's Mr. BJ Takushi. BJ comes from LA Metro in Los Angeles, California. BJ is LA Metro's principal safety specialist. He has 12 total years of transportation experience, including five years at LA Metro in corporate safety, where he performed accident investigations, conducted internal audits, and managed corrective action plans for LA Metro's rail system. BJ serves as the lead for LA Metro's PTASP effort. He has an MS in engineering management, and he is a certified safety specialist. He has a TSSP for both bus and rail, and his PTS CTP certification from TSI. And with that, I'm now going to hand the microphone over to BJ. BJ, it's all yours. Thank you, Andy, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank the FTA for uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, it's an honor to be able to, to join these distinguished industry leaders who, who had such great presentations before me. Thanks, uh, Frank and Nick, as well. I'd, I'd also like to kind of just echo the sentiments of Frank and Nick with regard to all of LA Metro's frontline employees who were providing needed transit service to all of LA's essential workers, uh, and as well as all the agencies throughout the nation. You know, um, we were all frontline right, during this uh, COVID pandemic. So LA Metro, uh, at, at LA Metro, we operate both bus, bus and rail modes and serve over 18 million passengers uh, per month with a bus fleet of over 2,400 and a rail fleet of over uh, 400 light rail cars and heavy rail cars, uh, operating and maintaining over 100 miles of track on light and heavy rail over six different lines. And we have another 35 or so miles coming online in the next few years with, uh, with line extensions as well. We have a workforce of over 10,000 employees at various locations throughout our system. So we are we're definitely not considered a small transportation agency. We're, we're quite large, but we cover the service area throughout throughout Los Angeles County, both bus and rail. Um, oh, yeah, we also have uh, 27 different divisions and locations to support public transit. I don't know if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so so for safety event investigation, as well as I guess implement imp, implementing the PTAS in general, our team followed a few principles when creating each section of the plan. Uh, a constant theme we kept going back to uh, was the, the first bullet you see on the screen, and that's kind of to read the regulation, identify the requirements, and, and comply. We literally went line by line on the rule, uh, rule 673, and highlighted every requirement of the re our regulation to make sure we incorporated it within our PTAS. For the rail side, we, we also, I, I know uh, Andy mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, it didn't really cover uh, Rule 674, but we also had to refer to that um, because that affected our implementation as well. And our PTASP, we, we merged both, uh, we, we had one PTASP that 
merge both, both bus and rail as opposed to separate P-TASPs. So with this philosophy in mind of read the regulation, identify requirements, and comply, uh, we relied on our existing internal processes that we already had in place, uh, as was mentioned, you know, I mean, and we had to, we had to adapt those processes for the regulation and kept back, hey, we, we looked at our processes, said, hey, what needs to change? As was mentioned uh, in Andy's presentation, what are, what are the gaps that we had? So we really needed to uh, dig into that. And another, another aspect of that was through our state safety oversight agency requirements. And that, that goes back to the 674. They already had to have um, certain, certain parts of their programming in place that we were able to kind of utilize that existing process to add elements within our PTAS to be, be in compliance with, uh, with the PTAS uh, regulation. Um, yeah, and it, it wasn't so hard because they, they had a pretty good structure through their, their, through their general orders as they changed their regulation, we adapted, right? So we modified our existing processes even before the PTAS regulation went into effect back in uh, 2020 and before it was extended. So we, we were able to um, get board approval and state oversight approval um, at the time of uh, the regulation went into official effect without deferment. And that kind of brings me to the next part of our implementation was to use our resources to solicit feedback on the plan that we did put in place. Uh, we provided a draft of our plan to various various groups, um, both internal to Metro as well as from our state safety oversight. Um, like I, I believe it was Frank that may have mentioned, you know, you, to get that feedback from the subject matter experts on what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it safely. That that was invaluable to see to uh, to add to our our plan, right? And we also submitted uh, the, our plan to the to the FTA's Technical Assistance Center, who provided great feedback as well. Yeah, so and we implemented that within our existing plan. So next slide. So to give you a little perspective of what we do at LA Metro, uh, most of our events are investigated at the local level and input into an electronic reporting system um, by someone in a supervisory role. Uh, the first phase is really to respond to an event. So an event occurs, um, communicate with, with uh, let's take an example of a rail event. Uh, a, a train gets into an accident with a car. The train operator will will call up the control center and say, "Hey, I got a I got a uh, train versus vehicle at this particular location," giving them all the information. And that's really where where the event investigation starts, gathering the information, going out there, a supervisor going out there to identify a lot of a lot of um, the facts, fact finding, gathering the data, but without without getting too into the weeds. Basically, both bus and rail have standard operating procedures as to how to handle events and respond to those events. Essentially, initial, like I said, initial fact finding and information gathering, and then inputting that into our electronic uh, record system. Additionally, both the bus and rail modes have accident investigation procedures established within our PTAS, which outlines those expectations of our process. So we can go back and when we when we review if there's an accident, are we following these particular procedures as we need to? And it's also kind of an element within within the PTAS on if we're not, hey, how can we improve that? Having that continuous improvement process part of the um, safety assurance um, element of, of SMS, right? So Within our SMS structure, safety is, is 
kind of handled, I mean, at all levels, obviously, but handled at the division level. And our safety department is more of a group that provides oversight, guidance, and advice. Uh, keeping this in mind, our safety department doesn't investigate all events. We leave a lot of the events to be handled at that division level. Um, so typical accident investigations that will occur um, at our safety department level will be when an event, typically accidents, uh, reach a certain threshold, like a fatality or a serious injury, derailments, fires, et cetera. Um, so we do have a collision investigation unit that's on call 24 seven to respond to these serious uh, in accidents that, that meet a certain threshold. So that's just some of what we're doing. Um, our safety department gets notified and when we, when we send, when we send out our notification, when we get the notification, we send it out to, if it meets that criteria, we send it out to the state safety oversight as well to let them know, hey, uh, this has happened, do you wanna come out? And if it meets a certain threshold, it may even go to the FTA for their records as well. So, um, and for, for rail accidents, we, we rely on that, those frontline supervisors and operators to kind of, and really any employee uh, within the agency that, ha that is inv involved in an event, um, to gather that information that we then utilize and synthesize. And it was talked about utilizing CCTV cameras or uh, on our rail systems and our bus lines, we have, we have on our bus lines, we have Smart Drive, which is a, a, an event recording uh, monitoring, uh, a video monitoring system. And we can capture that data and, and look at it and identify, you know, because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? We can identify exactly what was, what was going on. So for our rail in incidents, we actually sit down with our SSOA, our, uh, our um, oversight agency, the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission's Commission, and we identify these primary and contributing uh, causal factors um, for these safety events. So that's what we're doing on a regular basis. Go oh, next slide. So, so some of these, some of the useful um, resources that we use to to put together our p-test and identify safety events and what kind of tried to pick around what exactly the FTA was looking for um, when when creating. Uh, a lot of this was the National Transportation Safety Plan. I got a, I guess you guys are gonna get the uh, PowerPoint presentation so you can use that link as well. Uh, the NTD Safety Security Policy Manual, that, that outlines a lot of um, what these reporting thresholds are uh, for, for a lot of these safety events. And if you are a rail, um, a rail agency, uh, 49 CFR 674, and even if you're not a, a rail agency, it gives you a good idea um, in the appendix of 674 of what constitutes NTD reporting, uh, what's an occurrence, ex and gives examples of occurrences and things of that nature uh, for you to utilize in your in your P-test. As well as we we use the two-hour act the FTA's two-hour accident reporting guidance. Um, just to get an idea of what our requirements were under under the whole uh, PTAS regulation. So ho hopefully you can utilize some of those resources to, to enhance your program um, and plan. With that, that's, uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'll turn it back over to Andy. BJ, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks for your time today. And thanks also to Frank and Nick. And I just wanna let all our participants know um, there, our our guests, our industry presenters aren't going anywhere. They're going to be around for our Q and A session, which we're about to kick off. So, if you do have any questions for them, please feel free to enter them into the Q and A pod. 
Um, before we get started in our Q&A session, I do want to um, point out how you can reach the PTAS Technical Assistance Center. If you have any questions related to Part 673, related to implementation,